Good day, everyone. We are Albaisay, Daniel Rachel, Tinsa Ralph, and Rodriguez Arza. And we will be dis- discussing cause, manner, and mechanism of death. First and foremost, we humbly um, invite you to a prayer. Lord, I am grateful for this day and for the gift of education. Thank you for giving me another day and another opportunity to learn. As I prepare for class, I ask for your protection and guidance. Please be with me as I sit in class and help me to focus on the lesson and not be afraid to ask questions or to ask for help when I needed it most. I pray for diligence in my studies. Please help me to understand what I am learning and apply it. Grant me the discipline to study what I am being taught and help me to be an example of your son to my classmates. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Introduction Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy defines death as the irrevocable loss of personhood and death as the irreversible termination of organismic activity. It is the total and ongoing absence of breathing, heartbeat, and other essential bodily functions. The exact meaning of human death remains subject to debate and varies depending on culture and legal systems. It has always been muddled by mystery and superstition. On the other hand, in medical aspect, death refers to the irreversible loss of heart and lung function or the complete brain, including the brainstem. There are three categories of death in pathology, the cause, manner, and mechanism of death. Cause of death. Cause of death refers to the natural diseases or injuries that cause sociologic changes and resulted in death. It is direct, continuous sequence of events unbroken by any efficient intervening cause and without which the result would not have occurred. An etiologically specific disease or injury. In noting the cause of death of a person, the following terminology must be distinguished. Immediate cause of death, final disease or condition that leads to death underlying proximate cause of death, other conditions that precede and initiate the train of morbid events that ultimately culminate in the immediate cause of death, intervening cause, any condition that interrupts or exacerbates the chain or proximate causation contributing factors of death, other conditions that play a role in the death process but are not the primary cause of death. An autopsy is an essential tool to identify the cause of manner of death. Clinical autopsy performed to diagnose the disease that led to natural death, medical legal or forensics of autopsy performed to provide information about the identity Cause of death, time of death, circumstances of death, etc. To support the law enforcing agencies to solve a possible crime. Manner of death. These are the circumstances surrounding death, how the death came about, or how the injury or disease leads to death. Mainly, Based on seen investigation, interviews with next of kin, review of medical history or records, autopsy, and ancillary studies. Studies that include toxicology, histopathology, vitreous chemistry, microbiology, and etc. It is the classification or categorization used for how the death came about. A judgment based on the examination and circumstances surrounding the fatal event. 
In most jurisdictions, five categories are used. First are the natural category. It is due entirely or nearly so to natural disease process. Second is homicide, which due to a volitional act of another person with the intent of to cause fear, harm, or death, and some negligent acts even when a person did not intend to cause harm. Example of negligent acts designated homicide. Example of these are caretaker leaves illicit drug on a table which a toddler consumes and dies from an overdose or intoxicated adult falls asleep on top of an infant resulting in asphyxiation of the child. Homicidal manner does not indicate a criminal homicide which is determined by the legal process and not by the certifier of death. Next is suicide. It is due to injury that occurred with the intent to induce self-harm or cause one's own death. Next is accidental or accident. Due to, due to injury when there is no evidence of intent to harm. And lastly, undetermined. Inadequate information regarding the circumstances of death to determine manner. Example of this is when an individual found unconscious with large subdural hemorrhage or in the absence of information on the large on the events leading up to death, it may not be possible to determine if the hemorrhage is due to accidental fall, homicidal violence, or etc. Mechanism of death is the immediate physiological derangement resulting in, in death. Example of these are hemorrhage, sepsis, or asphyxia, which is not etiologically specific. It is defined as the immediate physiological derangement resulting in death. Particular mechanism of death can be produced by a variety of different causes of death and are never etiologically specific. Example is are hemorrhage, cardiac arrhythmia, cerebral hypoxia, sepsis, asphyxiation, disseminated intravascular coagulation or DIC. The mechanism of death is usually not specific to the condition that led to death. Example of this are hemorrhage can be associated with natural. Example of this is metastatic disease or traumatic causes, uh, which includes gunshot wood to the chest. To understand more about the differences in cause, manner, and mechanism of death, please watch this video. Hi everyone, this video is on death, manner, mechanism, and cause for forensic science. Let's start by looking at case 67203. The body of a 50-year-old man is discovered in the basement of a mall. Detectives this time are going to handle finding the suspects. Your role is to estimate the time of death for this individual. So being the forensic investigator you are, you immediately make observations and collect data. What you're able to discern is that the skin of this individual is pale. The body is at about 90 degrees Fahrenheit when the ambient temperature, the temperature of the basement, is at 78 degrees Fahrenheit. The body has a reddish color on the back that disappears when touched, and the limbs are starting to appear stiff. How could you use this data to estimate the time of death for this individual? Well, I'm confident that's something you'll be able to do after watching this video. So first off, well, what is death? Is death when you stop breathing? Maybe it's when your heart stops beating. Well, turns out that neither of those is currently the case. 
Humanity has developed better and better technology for keeping someone alive. Nowadays, I can use a defibrillator to get the heart to start beating again, or ventilators to keep the lungs breathing even though the person's body naturally can't. So, since I can keep the brain alive during these fail system failures, whether it's the heart or the lungs, maybe it's when the brain stops. My point here is that the definition of death has changed over time, and it's going to continue to change as our technology gets better and better. For legal purposes today, death is defined as occurring to an individual who has sustained either irreversible stoppage or cessation of their circulatory and respiratory functions, we're no longer able to get them to start back up, or irreversible cessation of all functions of the entire brain. When a person dies, their body goes through stages. The first stage is commonly called stoppage. When stoppage occurs, the heart stops beating, so there's no more oxygen or glucose sugar to reach the cells in your body. Your bodies need those to sustain their life functions. That means there's less energy for your cells. The thing here is some cells have reserves of oxygen and glucose so will keep them going for a little bit longer, but others don't. They'll immediately start dying once that supply is cut off. When this occurs, anaerobic respiration is going to take over for your cells. Normally, your cells do aerobic respiration with oxygen. In the absence of oxygen, they can kick over to anaerobic respiration with glycolysis and make a little bit of energy. The thing to keep in mind with this, though, is with aerobic respiration, I can make 36 to 40 ATP per oxygen molecule. That's a lot of energy. With anaerobic, I'm only making two. So this isn't going to be enough energy to sustain your body's cells in the long term when oxygen's been cut off. That's why toxic waste is going to start building up, especially from anaerobic respiration when things like lactic acid start developing. pH is going to become more acidic in your cellular environment and cells will rapidly die. After stoppage comes autolysis. Autolysis literally translates to self-digestion. Auto-self, lysis split. This is when enzymes inside the, the cells start to release and start digesting the components of the cell itself. You can see in this diagram a cell going from its normal circular structure to being broken down from those enzymes digesting it. So for our purposes in forensics, we want to know, well, how did the person die and what caused their death? This is decided by multiple professionals. One is the coroner. Coroners identify the body, meaning who is this person who died, notifies the families that the death has occurred, and issues a legal death certificate certifying the death. To become a coroner, you just have to be publicly elected or appointed. In many states, you need a little bit of medical training, but in some, you need none at all. It's a completely political position. Another professional is who we call the medical examiner. The medical examiner is going to be performing autopsies on the body and investigating manner and cause of death. To become a medical examiner, you must be a certified medical doctor. And there are also forensic pathologists. Forensic pathologists perform autopsies, investigate the manner and cause of death, but they can also determine the presence of disease and toxins and have training specific to the fields of forensics. To become a forensic pathologist, you must be a medical doctor and receive specialized forensic training. One of the things we want to consider when dealing with a death in our investigation is what we call the manner of death, or how did the injury cause a person to die? It could be what we call a natural death. This is the failure of a body function by age or disease. For example, a heart attack or kidney failure. A death could also have the manner of being an accidental death. It is an unplanned event that's causing the death. Perhaps there was a car accident or someone sustained a heavy fall. Death could also be suicidal. It is a purposeful act of killing oneself. Or it could be homicidal. This is when the death of one person is caused intentionally by another, such as with a murder. And this tends to be what we see in forensics on CSI and other TV shows. But medical examiners and forensic analysis can be used for all other types of death as well. Some deaths are undetermined. If the manner of death is unknown, we're not able to explain if it's a natural or accidental death, it'll be listed as undetermined. Let's practice identifying manners of death. Let's look at case one. A man with a heart condition is assaulted and dies from a heart attack during the assault. What would be the manner of death in this case? Well, it's actually homicidal. This, the purposeful assault is what ultimately caused the heart attack. Why did I classify it this way? 
Well, the assault is what we call approximate or underlying cause of death. If I were to think of what caused what caused what, the assault caused the heart attack, and that heart attack was ultimately caused by years of heart disease. So our assault would be our proximate cause, the heart attack is our final cause. Let's try another case. An elderly woman dies due to neglect by her son, who lived with her. What would be the manner of death in this case? Again, homicidal. That purposeful neglect is ultimately that proximate cause or what led to the elderly woman's death. Now, this is me analyzing it using our concepts in forensics, but ultimately a court of law is going to make the final decision on what the manner is. And this is where prosecution and the defense will analyze every possible angle to see, was it really the assault or really the neglect? Another term we use to describe death in addition to manner is the mechanism. The mechanism is a specific change in the body that caused the death. For example, an anti-mass protester purposefully coughs into someone's face and infects them with COVID-19. The individual coughed on is hospitalized and dies of respiratory failure. On the death certificate, should we list the cause as the purposeful cough, as the virus, as the failure of their lungs? What should we list for the manner? Well, here's an example of one such death certificate. Here, the underlying cause was identified as COVID-19. That infection by that virus is what led to the mechanism or the specific change in the body that caused death. Here, it's listed as acute progressive hypoxic respiratory failure. Lungs are failing to breathe oxygen to the rest of the body. What about the manner? Would I count this as homicidal or accidental? Again, court of law is going to determine what is the manner of death in this instance. Big thing here is mechanisms that specific biological change that caused the death. To determine when a death occurred, we would need to calculate what's known as the post-mortem interval or the PMI for short. That's the time interval since that individual died or when you discovered it up to the point when they died. To use death to calculate PMI, it turns out that the body changes in predictable ways and stages after death occurs. And this happens the same way for all individuals. In science, you always want to ask yourself, well, how do we know that? To determine the stages of death, we have and currently do utilize something called a body farm. People who donate their bodies, refer to them as cadavers, their bodies are placed out into different environmental conditions and we wait and see how the death progresses. This research lets us be able to determine when a person dies. So taking this data from body farms, we now understand the progression of the body after death. And death is also referred to as mortis. This progression goes through the following stages or phases. Pallor mortis, alger mortis, liver mortis, rigor mortis, and putrefaction or decay. Now, I don't want you to think this as A causes B causes C causes D, that it happens in a sequential order. A more accurate way to represent these phases would be like this. Counting the hours after death, here I have the first letter representing each of the phases. These stages overlap one another and can occur at the same time. Here you can see that polar happens the same time as alger. Alger is occurring when liver and rigor is occurring, and putrefaction is occurring after. So as I go through these in the order that the arrows are listed, just please keep in the back of your mind that they often overlap. Let's start with pallor mortis. Pallor means pale. Mortis, death. This occurs in the first 15 to 20 minutes after death. When this happens, the body becomes pale due to the lack of blood flow. Remember the stoppage stage of death. The body temperature will begin to decrease as well because that oxygen flow isn't occurring, isn't helping generate that heat that the body releases. This isn't very useful for determining a PMI because it really only tells you the body died about 15, 20 minutes ago. And odds are, if you're an investigator, you're not finding the body that quickly. The next phase, alger mortis, alger means cool, occurs up to 24 hours after death. And because that is much more useful. During alger mortis, the body begins to cool until it hits room or ambient temperature. There's a continuous loss of body heat, and the rate of that depends on the environmental conditions. It's useful for PMI up to 24 hours because we can calculate the time it would take for a body at regular room temperature to decrease down to the ambient or room temperature in the environment that it's found. 
When doing these calculations, something to keep in mind is that the time of cooling varies based on how long the body's been dead. The first 12 hours, the body loses an average of 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit per hour. For the next 12 hours, the heat loss is slower. It's at about 0.7 degrees Fahrenheit per hour. Let's put this data together to estimate the time of death based on Alvin Mortis. A body is discovered in the woods, had a body temperature of 80 degrees Fahrenheit. If the ambient temperature is 75 degrees Fahrenheit, when did this person die? And assume that the average body temperature is 98.6. So let's try this out. The first thing you want to do is subtract the average body temperature from the temperature of the body when you discover it. Doing that in this example, I'm going to take the assumed average body temperature, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, and subtract it from the body temp that I discovered the body at, which was 80 degrees Fahrenheit. That gives me 18.6 degrees Fahrenheit. What does that mean? That means that this body has lost 18.6 degrees Fahrenheit since the individual deceased. To give me an accurate PMI, the next step I need to do is determine how long it took for this individual to lose that many degrees. And you always want to be mindful of our rule that the first 12 hours is a loss of 1.4 per hour, and the second 12 hours is a loss of 0.7. So for the first 12 hours, if I take 12 hours and multiply it by 1.47 degrees Fahrenheit, that gives me 16.8 degrees Fahrenheit that should be lost during that time. Well, we know our individual lost 18.6, so then I know this body's been dead for longer than 12 hours. To figure out the remainder, I'm going to take my total loss, which was 18.6 degrees Fahrenheit, and subtract it from the first 12 hours, a loss of 16.8. That gives me 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's the amount of degree loss that I'm left needing to account for. How many hours would it take for this body to lose it? Well, keeping in mind that the second 12 hours, we lose 0.7 Fahrenheit degrees per hour. I'm going to take that 1.8, divide it by 0.7, and that gives me 2.5 hours to lose that many degrees. So adding these together, I know this body's been dead longer than 12 hours, an additional 2.5. I can estimate that approximately 14.5 hours ago, this individual died. This is very helpful data in a forensic investigation. And we can get this from only the second phase. We can get this directly from the second phase of death. Now the rate of algor mortis can change based on the environmental factors at play with the body. For example, surface area to volume ratios, if the individual is thin versus large. Small, thin objects have a very large surface area and small volume. That means heat can rapidly be lost through the surface area in those objects. Large objects, though, have a lot of volume, very little surface area, so there's less area for that heat to leave, so that heat dissipation can be slower. Clothing on the body can also slow down cooling. The function of our clothing is to keep us warm. It does that by trapping in our body heat. If an individual dies with significant clothing on, that's going to slow down the rate at which they lose their body temp. Also, the retention of fluid. If an individual is retaining a lot of water, that fluid is going to slow down the cooling process after they die. Wind can also accelerate cooling by propelling that heat further away from the body. And submerged bodies lose heat faster because that heat's able to go out into the water. Our next phase is a liver mortis. Liver means color. This one is noticeable two hours after death and permanent after eight. Liver refers to the pools, the color that forms from the pools of blood that gravity pulls down on whatever surface that body is on. As those blood cells and vessels decompose, gravity pulls the blood there and a color develops. This color is referred to as a lividity. This will be wherever pressure is applied on the body. And what's unique about it is it's very helpful for PMIs between two to eight hours. Because if I press the skin during that time range of two to eight, the color will momentarily disappear. That's huge. That lets me know a very small time frame when this individual died. If this body is older than eight hours, the color or levity will remain after I press it. Let's try this out. If you discover a body that has levity on the chest, left arm, and back, and levity disappears when pressed, what can you conclude about the time of death and what's happened to this body? 
Well, I know this person died two to eight hours ago because when I press, the color disappears. Since they have levity on their chest, left arm, and back, that means the body has had pressure applied to it, both in the front and in the back. This gives me a time estimate and insight into what may have occurred in regard to that person's death. Our next phase is rigor mortis. Rigor means stiff. This begins about two hours after death and peaks at 12 hours after death. Rigor is when the muscles become stiff, appearing to be kind of frozen in a position. Why does this happen? Well, moving your muscles, both relaxing and tightening, can require energy, but most of that energy is spent relaxing, not moving your muscles at all. So without the energy you normally get because aerobic respiration shut down, your muscles, instead of expending energy to relax, stiffen up. This peaks at 12 hours after death and then will begin to soften. Looking at this table, the first two to six hours after death is when rigor begins. Smaller muscle groups, such as the limbs, will start to tighten, but other larger muscle groups will stay relaxed. As we get closer to 12 hours, rigor is complete. All the muscles are now stiffened. And post 12 hours, we see the slow loss of rigor. Rigor becomes uneven and the muscles return to being relaxed. This too can be affected by environmental change, just like algor mortis. The big ones that affect rigor mortis is temperature. Colder temperatures can slow down rigor, warmer temperatures can accelerate it. The amount of activity an individual has had before their death, a lot of exercise can accelerate rigor, whereas sleep will slow it down. And body mass. Obese individuals have a slower progression in rigor, whereas thin individuals accelerate rigor. Again, we're seeing that difference in that surface area to volume ratio. The last phase is putrefication or decay. This is after all the other phases have occurred, well after 24 hours of death, and the body's beginning to be decomposed. In this phase, we go through the phases of decomposition, going from fresh to floating, active decay, advanced decay, and ultimately dry skeletal remains. So when investigating a dead body, keeping these phases in mind, the kinds of things you want to ask when thinking about a PMI are, is the body pale? That tells me it's been dead for more than 20 minutes. Is the body cool? And how cool compared to the environment? I can use that to do algor mortis calculations. Is there any lividity? Is there color on any part of the body and where? And if I press it, does the color disappear or stay? I can use that for a liver calculation. For rigor, are any parts of the body stiff? Which ones and how stiff? Or is the body going limp? And with putrefaction, do I see bloating? Do I see any decomposition? This body's been dead longer than 24 hours. Putting all this together, you can have some rate of decomposition rules of thumb that you can follow when calculating a PMI. If the body has some warmth to it and it's limp, it's been dead for less than three hours. If the body's warm and beginning to stiffen, it's been probably been dead for three to eight hours. If the body's cold and stiff, it's been dead for eight to 36 hours. And if it's cold and limp, you can be confident it's been dead for more than 36 hours. To determine the actual cause of death, rather than just the time, if you're not able to discern that just by looking at the body, an autopsy can be performed to give us more insight. An autopsy is a medical examination to determine the cause and mechanism of death. A reminder, this is performed by medical examiners and forensic pathologists. There are two types of autopsies that occur. The first is an external autopsy. During this process, pictures and notation are taken of the positions of the body and the new clothing that's being worn. Fingerprints are taken. Identifications of different mortises are taken. Is there vigor present and where? Is there rigor present and where? And we take various biostatistics, such as weight, temperature, and height. After the external anatomy is done, the individual who's performing it will then go on to an internal autopsy. Internal autopsies begin with a Y-shaped incision through the chest, at which point organs can be accessed, weighs, and weighed, and analyzed to see if there's any presence of disease. The brain similarly is removed and analyzed. Body fluids are collected and analyzed. This is the long part. It can take up to six hours, but the most fruitful because it gives us insight into those internal mechanisms that could have caused that individual's death. We can also use the digestive system to give us insight into when a person died and why. Examining the contents, I could see if maybe there's a toxin, a poison, or drugs 
in that person's digestive tract that could have led to their demise. And I can also establish potential locations and past behaviors. If I find specific fast food or unique foods, that can tell me where that individual was before they passed away. I can also determine a timeline. Here's how. If I find any undigested food, it is likely two to six hours since their last meal, since they ate that food. Going from the stomach to the small intestine, if I find any food in that small intestine, that means it's been six to 12 hours since that food that I find there, because that's how long that progression will take from mouth to stomach to small intestine. If I find any food in the large intestine, I know that it's been 12 hours since it ate the food making up the stool that I discovered. We can also use eyes as a way of establishing a timeline on when an individual may have passed. Moments after death, the eyes begin to dry out. Your eyes are constantly producing moisture. Once you die, that process ceases. Two to three hours after death, your eyes will begin to appear cloudy if your eyes are open when you die. If your eyes are closed when you die, it'll take upwards to 24 hours for them to begin to cloud. Helpful information, but limited because you need to discover this for a recent death. So let's return now to case 67203. I told you that the skin was pale, the body was 90 degrees Fahrenheit when the ambient temperature of the basement was 78 degrees, the body has a reddish color on its back that disappears when it's touched, and the limbs appear stiff. Could you now estimate the PMI of this individual? My hope is that you can. Thank you, and I'll see you next time. Thank you for listening, everyone.